Hi guys, welcome to the Hustle with Priscilla K. My name is Priscilla Kuma. If you're new here, subscribe, hit the notification button and stay. If you're already here, keep coming back and coming back for more videos. And hope you're getting ready to be the next guest on the Hustle. Keep safe because COVID is real. COVID is all over again. So protect yourself, protect your family. I have with me here, Alaji Mori. I sent shout out to him before and he's back on the seat today. Sit back, relax and hear what he has to say. Welcome to part two of the whole seat. This is a continuation with our Haji Rabi Mode, and I hope you enjoyed the part. Share my videos, leave comments below, and I'll see you soon. Take care. I'm changing lives, impacting life positively, and that is very commendable. You are a family person. Can you tell us a little about your background? You have kids, anything? Yes, so interestingly enough, um, my, I, I was born in a big polygamous family. My, my grandmother was the third of four wives of my grandfather. My mother was third of three wives of my dad. And fortunately, or fortunately, so the concept of polygamy is not something that I found upon because I'm a product of polygamy, and I think that is the best thing that ever happened to us as Muslims and as Africans. I think that the Chinese are a superpower because of their numbers. And then um, the United States of America has a population of about 260 million people. And they are great because of their numbers. Russia has a huge population. They are great because of their numbers. So in unity and in numbers is strength. And I think that for Africans, we should strive to, you know, that Africa is the next big thing because Africa is next in population and to China, and it's you have 60 to 70 percent of the population being used. And in the next 20 to 30 years, Africa will outtake Asia as the market for all goods and services. That tells you that you know, numbers matter. So um, I have three kids at the moment, wonderful kids, and then uh, we're hoping that whatever God maybe we'll add some. You've, you've spoken well. So are you going to, do you consider, um, do you see yourself getting married or having more than one wife? Every time this is a personal question, it's up to you if you want to answer it. Well, I think that never say never. Um, you know, it's not something that you want to shelve because as I said, I'm a proud product of polygamy. And mm -hmm. if I should desecrate the, the name polygamy, then I am doing it on my own self and my personality. So I'm not that kind of person who will say polygamy is not good you know, because I am a product of polygamy and I'm proud of it. So, yes, it's only God we, we, we plan, but God is actually the best of planets. So let's see. Yes. You seem to believe in Africa so much. You said Africa is the next big thing. So what is one major problem Africa has? Why I can't you compete with the world on a level our productivity is low, we can't match up with the market. What is Africa's problem right now? I think that I think that Africans do not want to learn about themselves and who they are and what they can they can provide the world. I mean there's globalization now, but the recent happenings of COVID has taught us that every country is looking inward and protecting themselves. Okay, mm -hmm. so we're, we're, we're having a rise in nationalism. So you're seeing the United States being nationalistic. You're seeing the United Kingdom being nationalistic. In fact, getting out of the European Union. You're seeing Germany being nationalistic. Now, some heroes of ours, you know, who are very concerned about the black man anywhere in the world, in Africa, in the diaspora, any part of the world, you know, is concerned about the well-being of the African people, such as um, Josiah Marcus Garvey, people such as Julius Nyerere, people such as uh, Malcolm X, uh, Martin Luther King, Kwame Nkrumah, and um, Mumba, all these people are people that see the African as as important as the Caucasian or European or the Arab or the South American, and they think that the African should stand tall on his feet anywhere in the world. But to be able to stand tall anywhere in the world, you need to believe in who you are, and believe in yourself. You need to identify your culture and the things that made you who you are. You need to be proud of your skin color. You need to be 
proud of your culture, your tradition, your identity as well. Do not buy any ideology, hook, line, and sinker because you feel inferior. Some of these people tried to let the Africans stand for, but unfortunately, their lives were curtailed, obviously, for a reason or the other that I don't want to go into. But I think that the African is suffering from an identity crisis. Um, our history did not start from the slave trade or colonization. But I think that the well-being of the African anywhere in the world should matter to any African anywhere in the world. Your success in the United States as a black African should be interlinked with mine in Africa and for anybody else in the Middle East. So we need to have a concerted effort to unite Africans everywhere in the world because whether you like it or not, you are not recognized by being Ghanaian, Nigerian, or South African, or, or, or Burundian, or Congolese. Once you are seen as black, your problems everywhere in the world is the same. Every race in the world feels they are better than the black skin. And for that, it's enough for us to think about this and have a united front as to how we can overcome this. First and foremost, we have to find a selfless kind of leadership. Leadership that is in tune with the needs and aspirations of the needs of the African people everywhere in the world. It's consciously view that web of unity between Africans here in the world, here in Africa and in the diaspora. We have had rifts with Africans from Africa and then Africans or American um, African Americans in the diaspora. That is very, very wrong and it shouldn't happen at all. You should also in, invite Africans in the diaspora to see Africa as the next big thing, a place for investment, because all these other Europeans, all these other Asians come to Africa and plunge Africa. But you in the diaspora also have a state in Africa as well. We're better off having other um, American, African Americans coming in and investing and taking the proceeds wherever you are, rather than other you know, nationalities or other races that look down upon the African yet come to take the resources of Africa. So we need to have selfless leadership of Africans and um, um, Africans that love the continent and protect and preserve, you know, the unity and the sanctity of the African where it is. We need to have honest um, education. We need to have um, leaders that are generational thinkers that think about what will happen to the African in the next 50, 100, 200 years and make plans that will, you know, augur well for the generations yet unborn so that when they meet their counterparts 100 years from now, they can stand tall and even complete an ideology and will be respected um, on that level. So I think that, yes, critical generational leadership is important. And um, that is why in my small way within our communities, we're trying to raise those kinds of children that are global citizens, that think global and act local. You know, and um, we're starting one step at a time and hopefully it's, it's that Africa that we all want. Well said. Africa is beautiful. We, are, we have a lot of resources. People come and tap into it and go and we are not able to use them to our own good. It's high time we all come back home and invest in Africa. Africa, I'm, I'm always championing Africa in my own way. Anytime I cross, come across somebody who wants to be enlightened, I, I tell them Africa is beautiful. You should travel to Ghana, travel to Kenya, travel to Nigeria. Africa is not what they portray on TV. Africa is beautiful. And some think Africa is just a country and not a continent. So we have a lot of education to do. And I believe we'll get there one day. So are you for one? united africa or are you against it can africa all the countries come together and be one africa or i don't know if you're trying to get what i'm trying to i say. think i think earlier i spoke to you about pan-africanism and you had people such as dr Kwame kuma championing the need for a united africa yeah um, unfortunately that did not materialize because of the blocks that europeans had placed on them um, on the countries of africa so you have cultures, you have tribes, and Europeans came to, you know, demarcate all these countries regardless of your culture and your tradition and your language. So problems of our countries here in Africa at the moment as a result of, of the scramble of Africa and some Europeans sitting somewhere saying that, look, I take Togo, you take Ghana, somebody else take Gambia, somebody else is coming. 
it, we should be a force to be reckoned with. At the moment, Africa contributes less than 5% of global trade, even though um, the medium for which you and I are speaking now, the coal tan that is used in our mobile phones, in our computer chips, are all from the Congo basin. Yeah. Um, so it is it's rather unfortunate that Africa is set to contribute 25% of it, yet most of the, the, of the resources coming from Africa. There's some hypocrisy. For now, I think that we can start with just like the Europeans have done, like an African commission where we can have um, smooth trade amongst member countries because um, amongst member countries, we do not have as much inter-trade. There's more trade between Africa and Europe, Africa and Asia, and Africa mm -hmm. and North America, rather than even intra-Africa countries trading. So for now, we should be able to look inward and be able to trade amongst ourselves. Secondly, we should be able to build the infrastructure that will allow for easy movement of goods and services and people as well. Can you believe that it is more expensive to fly from here to Paris than to fly from here to Mali, which is one fifth of the, of the journey? Yes. And if you have to place a call to Togo, it has to go to France before it is rerouted to Togo, which is only three hours drive from the center of Accra. So these barriers have to be cut. We have to inter-trade, we have to inter- you know, relate, we have to do, we have to open the infrastructure, railway, we have to open our water borders, our borders such that um, trade is easy. We have to facilitate um, the common currency um, regime. At the moment, there's the Africa Continental Free Trade Agreement that will allow West African countries to trade amongst themselves, use a common economic currency. Uh, you know, there, there are still talks underway with the headquarters inaugurated in Accra a couple of weeks ago. So this is a step in the right direction. But mind you, Uma had thought about this for 50 years ago. And the powers that be put a stop to it even before Europeans thought about the European Union only in 1990. So you can see that everybody tries to advance their interest. And it's up to us as Africans to be able to realize what our problems are, and how we can advance our interest economically, politically, socially, and culturally. Personally, I think we need people like you, young, vibrant, knowledgeable, and very passionate to make a change in leadership. People like you oh, have yeah. traveled wide, you've seen what is happening yeah. on the world terrain, and you would bring all these ideas together to make it happen. But electing people who are older, who don't even know how to use technology, and we can't go anywhere. It saddens my heart to see how beautiful the continent is and we have all these struggles. Somebody's in leadership for years, they wouldn't want to go anywhere. We need young, vibrant people like you who are passionate. The underlying right. word is passionate. I think, I, think, I think the underlying word, as you rightly said, is passion and then, you know, that, that, that self-awareness and readiness to die for the continent. I think that the wave is blowing. Recently, you saw protests in Nigeria uh, and SARS, and you see that majority of them were youth. Many other African countries, you see the youth coming up and then, you know, going against authority for people that are septuagenarians and octogenarians. And you see a lot of young people getting into politics. So you have um, them taking positions of members of parliament and things like that. So I think that it's just a wave. Over time, you'd have a youthful parliament where um, ideas are exchanged rather than parties sloganeering and things like that. So I think, yes, one step at a time, even aside the party political politics side, by even having youthful engagements. Recently, we had um, youthful engagements in Mamobi, in Nima, where the um, head of parliament aspirants pledged to peaceful elections and during this year's election. So we have the youth participating in that decision process. You know, so the failure to youth were not very interested in politics. And now they are very interested in the happenings of their community, how they elect their leaders, their assembly members, their representations everywhere. So I'm seeing an increase in youth participation. And in only in about maybe four, five, six, to 10 years, we'll have an active number of youth actually partaking in the decision-making process. And who knows, maybe our next president I'd be very used. Nice. We hope for the best for Africa. 
the youth are waking up. I love the end such protest. It was peaceful and everything ended how it ended. But at least we are beginning to hold our leaders responsible and that is the right direction to, to, to go. What has been your challenge in helping do this charity work you're doing? What is the challenge in the Muslim community of Ghana? Well, I think that um, <laughs> our challenges are numerous. The reason is that the faith in itself allows for communal living. And then because of that kind of communal living and then, and then giving and receiving, welcoming people, Muslim communities have become very populated. So you have the inner city and Zongo communities where that are called Zongos, where you have loads of people there. So geospatially, the amenities are stretched, the educational facilities are stretched, there are more people per square meter, there are fewer um, recreational areas, there are fewer schools, there's unemployment, and all the issues that comes with any slum area. So you have drug abuse, you have teenage pregnancy, you have you have um, um, youth delinquency and all of that. So these are many problems that bedevil the Zongo and Muslim communities. Education is the backbone of everything. That is why we've taken education as our mainstay. The other people that are looking at um, getting the youth into meaningful employment and learning skills, you know, the other people that are looking at getting drug addicts out of the streets and getting them to learn something beneficial. Other people that are organizing reading clubs, exercise clubs, you know, and um, so the problems are many. Um, but as many as they are, it behoves upon us to hold one part of the problem and deal with it. Yeah. And as you can see, I'm dealing with education, I'm dealing with youth mentorship, um, area guidance, counseling, and the other people that are doing uh, other other works as well. So by and large, I think we're making progress. You know, we've helped young people even access schools in America and in Europe through our networks. And then um, they will come back into their communities and give back during the vacation. We have some of them teaching in these public schools. We have some of them helping other kids take advantage of scholarships in schools in America, in Canada, in Europe and in other parts of the world. So we're seeing a gradual shift in the header to um, rowdy Zumbu communities. We're now more um, appealing, you know, Zumbu community. Now people in other communities are fighting, even claim a part of the Zumbu. That tells you that there's positive progress that is happening. Many um, house staffs, many of the artists are using house as, as as their medium of speech. You know, the house of words and that and, and foods and clothing and culture has has immersed themselves into the Ghanaian cultural fabric and it's now positives. Culture and diversity is very beautiful. I appreciate all the work you're doing. We need more people to come help fix our environment. We start from a community level, then by and large, we make a bigger change in our country and the continent as well. You've traveled wide. What are some of the countries you've been to and which one is your best? And by, I mean, well, I'm appealing to you, you might think maybe if I have to leave Ghana one day, this country is a place I can stay. I think that um, our prophet admonishes us to travel and see. You know, and, and the first few verses of the Quran speak about seeking knowledge. And, and at the time, China was probably the farthest place from Arabia. And he said that if you had to go to China to seek knowledge, then go as far as then. Traveling has a way of exposing you to different kinds of people, different cultures. And, and then it, it helps you to know how to live amongst people. It helps you to be tolerant. It helps you to accept divergent opinions. It helps you to appreciate people and why they do the things that they do. And luckily, because as I said, I had some privileges as a young person, Europe was my first, you know, go-to. And um, the civilization in Europe, lots of it is very, very similar. So if you go to countries such as Belgium, France, Italy, um, Spain, the UK, Netherlands, Germany, you'd see the architecture 
it's very, very similar. Their way of life are very, very similar. Their foods, you know, their clothing, their festivals are very, very similar. Aside Germany, that had to change a lot of the architecture due to the Second World War between 1939 and 45. Most of Europe is the same, really. Um, and also, depending on what age bracket you fall, that will determine where I think that you want to go you know, and live your life. I think North America is probably one of the greatest places on earth. The only problem that I have with North America is their human development index. So Europe, in terms of human rights, and in terms of um, appreciation of race, Europe is miles, light years ahead of North America. I can't believe that in 2020, black people are having these kinds of challenges in North America. These things exist everywhere in the world, but they are very, very, very subtle. Scandinavia, some places in Europe, they've gone way past it, look beyond the color of your skin to accord you the respect that you demand. So North America gives opportunity, but I think that in terms of the human development index, I would root for Europe rather than North America, even though North America has a lot more opportunity, migrants everywhere else in the world. When it comes to holiday in the best places, I'll tell you are all in Africa. In fact, Ghana, the Volta region of Ghana, has some amazing land views and landscapes and water bodies and the weather is amazing. If you go to northern parts of Ghana, you have bare land that can be used for all kinds of investments. You know, you have wild flora and fauna. And um, the best we have is in Africa because you don't have to worry about too much weather extremes. You don't have to worry about tornadoes, landslides, mudslides, volcanoes, you know, all of those things. I think that is what makes Africa unique. And so I wouldn't trade anywhere in the world. I've been to the Middle East, I've been to some parts of Africa, I've been to Europe, I've been to North America. And I think my still my best place would be Africa. I like the way you champion in Africa. There you have it, guys. Come invest in Africa. Africa is beautiful. The weather is beautiful. As you mentioned, we don't have all these volcanoes and mass lights and stuff. So come see Africa. Come see the roots of everything. Before I let you go, I know you're very busy. One very last question. Do you think religion is a problem in Africa? Is religion dividing Africans? It is important to understand the difference between religion and spirituality. And I think that it is one thing that Africans, for that matter, have not been able to, to separate, okay? So religion is a set of rules that guide your moral conduct. But your interconnection with whatever spiritual being that you have, and that will guide you to do um, deeper things rather than just doing the ad hoc, everyday rituals. That is what we call spirituality. And much of spirituality is much of um, the rules of the world. If you throw an apple up, it will come down. It's just mm -hmm. by gravity. So these are natural laws. So much of spirituality are actually in tandem with natural laws. And what is natural law? Just be your neighbor's keeper. Just do unto others what you wish others to do to you. We are so engulfed in the religion of going to church, of that social gathering, of dancing, of jumping, of looking for miracles rather than getting connection with our maker. And I think that when you have a grasp of the understanding of the two, then that will determine to a large extent your approach towards life. So Africans are in their predicament because they value religion more than spirituality. Before Christianity and Islam came, Africans were deeply spiritual and not religious. And many of our problems, you know, were not this many when we were that spiritual. So I think that our being would have to be that religion and to get ourselves back, we have to go back to spirituality. So um, that is my little uh, contribution. Thank you very much for coming on to the show. You've supported this YouTube career of mine. You've always encouraged me and I'm glad I'm doing it. I'm still here. Thank you so much. And any last words before you leave? I think ultimately my, my concern would have to be the youth because the youth have the energy, they have the time, they have the resources. 
where you where you stand now is where you will reap in the next 15 years. It is important that whilst you have the strength, the mind, the energy, the time, you should be able to put in as much foundation into your life as possible. You need to be able to invest in yourself in all avenues. You need to create the future that you want. You need to look at the opportunities around you and tap into them. Do not wait for people to create those opportunities. It's important to be the own architect of your life. And um, I always encourage the young people to do that. You know, so that in the future, they won't sit down. And, you know, they won't have health care. They won't have people to you know, help them with their daily bread and things like that. That is a real bother. Young people take advantage of, um, of, the, of the opportunities around you. Educate yourselves as much as possible. You know, add value to yourselves in terms of your career, and develop your spiritual, um, psychological, emotional, and senses. You know, get financial knowledge as much as possible. And I think that you can take it. Thank you very much, Alaji Rabi Modi, for coming onto the show. You exude so much positivity and. You are proud of what you're doing, and I hope to bring you back onto the hot seat because you have so much to you have so much information to share, so much knowledge to share, and this is the right place to put them on. So thank you very much, and have a good day. Thank you. Bye bye. Bye.